So this process of growth within macrophage, uh, macrophages, lysis of the macrophages, release of the bacteria, phagocytosis by immigrating macrophages, and again, intracellular replication. The cycle continues for a period of about a week or two, and at that point, the bacteria escape from this initial primary lesion that's been formed, initially into the lymph nodes that drain the region of the lung that's affected by infection, and then they reach the bloodstream, probably carried there by the thoracic duct, although we really don't know the details. Now, uh, so this process of dissemination through the lymphohematogenous route is critical for establishing infection at secondary sites uh, within the lungs as well as within extrapulmonary organs. So the lung is, of course, the, the primary target of tuberculosis. That's its favorite niche, and that is the location from which the bacterium disseminates to secondary hosts. But in fact, in about 10% of all cases of TB, there is involvement of one or more extrapulmonary organs as well. And TB, uh, being a protean bacteria, can adapt to almost any environment and, in fact, can cause disease of the spleen, the liver, the bone, the eye, you name it. Any organ system is, uh, can be susceptible to tuberculosis. But the lung is for sure the most important organ affected. And by seeding through the hematogenous route, all parts of the lung uh, become infected with the tubercle bacillus, which goes again through this process of infection of macrophages and formation of uh, what are called now secondary lesions that are seeded by the bloodstream rather than the airway. Now at about this point, the host normally wakes up to the fact that it has been infected and mounts an adaptive immune response against the organism. And this is signaled by the arrival in these lesions of T lymphocytes that recognize specifically antigens of the tubercle bacillus. And in about 95% of individuals who are infected, that immune response succeeds in arresting the further progression of disease at this stage. About 5% of infected individuals, and in particular those who are immune compromised for any reason, disease will continue to progress soon after infection. We call this primary tuberculosis. But the fact is the overwhelming majority of individuals control infection after this dissemination stage at a point where they are probably not even aware they're infected. They have no obvious signs or symptoms of infection. Now, latent infection can last a lifetime. And in fact, in old studies from the early 20th century, it was shown that latently in infected individuals who have died of other causes uh, will yield viable tubercle bacilli upon culture of lung homogenates. So we know the tubercle bacillus, once it has infected you, is capable of persisting for a lifetime. Most of those infections will remain latent uh, for throughout the remainder of the individual's life, but in a minority of cases, about 5 to 10% over the course of a lifetime, individuals with latent TB infection will reactivate. For reasons we really don't understand, in a minority of latently infected individuals, reactivation will occur at some time later in life. So that's about a 5 to 10% cumulative lifetime risk of reactivation in people who are latently infected. When reactivation occurs, it usually occurs in the upper as opposed to the lower uh, lung fields. We really don't understand the reason for this, but it illustrates the importance of this lymphohematogenous dissemination of infection that occurs as an early event of tuberculosis. Infection normally occurs in the lower airways. That's because this is the, by far the best ventilated part of the lung when we are standing or uh, sitting upright. But reactivation and progressive TB usually occur in the upper airways. And th those lesions are seeded by the bloodstream. 